it's time for the improv monologue. <laughs> Okay, ladies and gentlemen, here is the thing. What I did was I did the improv monologue for the word of today, which is opprobrium, and I did it without actually finishing my setup. I failed to set up my microphone, so I didn't have any sound on that thing. So what I'm about to do is something that I've always kind of had in my back pocket, but haven't had to do yet, which is I'm going to be able to backtrack to the previous day's word of the day. I haven't seen it. Um, so I'll be able to keep the freshness of the improvisational moment, which is be inspired by something new and not have practiced what I'm about to talk about. So, um, yesterday's, today's word was opprobrium, opprobrium, and, uh, I think if I swipe backwards here, I can get to yesterday's, and that is gelid or gelid, probably gelid, gelid. It is gelid, and it is an, ad an adjective. And, and actually, it's a word that, it being winter now, officially, yesterday was the first day of winter, the 21st of December. And um, unfortunately, it's not really that gelid out here. Not now. But I do know what gelid is. I know exactly what it means to be extremely cold, which is what gelid actually means. Uh, when I was in the service, when I was in Alaska, I discovered what extreme cold truly meant. And I know that any of you who are in Alaska or any of you who are north of the Arctic Circle already know what this means. Um, probably if you live in Canada, you already know what this means. But I was born in Texas. So this was really a more new experience for me. I had the farthest north and the most cold winters that I'd ever experienced prior to this were in Omaha, Nebraska. And I can remember one year for a period of time that we got an Arctic blast from Canada straight down through the Dakotas that said um, we were going to be under 30 below and they issued parkas to everybody. That's how cold that was. And that was about the same time that I was leaving Nebraska. So I never even got a parka. I just got sent away. So I never really got to thoroughly experience that until I went to Alaska on a remote tour. Uh, I was spent a year in Clear Air Force Station, Alaska, and um, it was actually not a horrible year. I had a great time there. It was a great mission. I had some amazing friends that I made up there. And when you're on a remote and you're isolated from everything, that's what happens. You connect with people, hopefully, and then you do that. Uh, but I discovered what gelid meant when I was there because when I landed in November is what I want to I want to say was the month that I arrived there uh it was already 40 degrees below zero 40 degrees below zero and it was pretty much that for the remainder of the winter and we were just right on the edge of the Arctic Circle. So not only was it at least 30 to 50 below all the time, but it was also no sun. You never saw the sun. Once the sun went down at that, at that uh, location right at the edge of the Arctic Circle, you just didn't see it again until spring. And then, and then it was just weird then. Because then after a while, summer came and you, you saw it all the time. And so you just had the whole midnight sun thing going on. Well, I, we had the we had the noon darkness going on. And yes, we had the aurora borealis and the gorgeous northern lights and a lot of those things. But th the key here is gelid. It's the cold. It's the cold is the key that I'm thinking about. And this is what's coming into my mind here as I'm thinking about this because I, as I said, was born in Texas. And one of the gentlemen that I was stationed up there with, Max, was also from Texas. And um, we connected because we had this in common. We were two misplaced Texans um, right on the Arctic Circle who were freezing our butts off. And we worked crew together. We worked in Santa Val together. We did office work. We did everything. A lot of stuff together. We went fishing together when the weather was appropriate. But I can remember this night because it was so cold and we were so on remote. And so we were so enjoying some beverages. And in this case, it was uh, beers. We were having some beers. We had several beers that night, more than we arguably should have because, uh, because we were also very much being Texans at the time. I think we were both wearing our, uh, wearing our cowboy boots and jeans and 
just enjoying some beverages, some cold ones. So we uh, did decide at one point that we wanted to go out and see if the Aurora Borealis was out. Now, the best thing to do if you want to go see it and get a really good look at it is to take off outside of the building and head toward the tree line, which is a couple of hundred yards away. And then when you get out there, you're away from all of the light pollution that comes from the buildings and the site. Uh, so we did. We grabbed our beers and we put on our parkas and we grabbed our gloves and we started walking out toward the tree line. And so we were trudging through snow and over the tops of these piles of it and just cruising along and we probably got about halfway to the tree line and I'm just guessing here because there's a lot of things I don't clearly remember about that night, but I do remember this. Max stopped for a second and he said, Steve, there, hold on there for a second. I'm like, what, what's up, Max? And he goes, I'm not sure we should be doing this right now. And I'm like, I, I, well, we haven't even gotten to the tree line and I want to see the Aurora. We all want to see the Aurora. Come on, it's cool. Well, you know, I'm just thinking maybe we should head on back inside. I'm like, let's just at least get to the tree line and find out. And I know that at some point he finally reached me with this. Steve, we need to turn around and go back. I don't want to turn around and go back. Steve, take a drink of your beer. Oh, okay. I mean, we've been drinking beer all night, so I'll take a drink of my beer. So I go to take a drink of my beer. And I can't. It's not pouring. It's not pouring. And I don't understand why it's not pouring. It's not pouring out the way it has been all night. But it's not empty either. No, what it is, is frozen. By the time we made it out halfway to the tree line, our beers had chilled to the point where they had just frosted over and would not even really pour out anymore. So we had reached this point of gelidness with our beer of extreme cold that we could not even enjoy it. And now I was at the point of realization where had I put my lips to the glass and just left it there for long enough, I probably would have found out what it was like to have my lips frozen to the top of the beer bottle, and I'm thankful that I had enough foresight not to do that. But, discretion being the better part of valor, and Texans being smarter than people give us credit for, we turned around and we walked back into the building at that moment, because I just had this vision suddenly of them come spring thaw, finding two Texans um, buried under a snow drift that had melted away, and uh, probably perfectly preserved at the 40 below with our half empty bottles of beer. And I thought that really isn't the way I wanted to be remembered in my life. So we did that, we left that, we did. And we went back in the building and, and we, we probably went back to the chow hall, which was still called a chow hall. Nobody was offended by that at the time. And I remember, I remember one night we went to the chow hall and we got coffee and it was late at night and when it's 40 to 50 below, this thing happens when you have your coffee outside, where if you take a steaming hot cup of coffee and you throw it up into 40 to 50 below temperature, well, what'll happen is it'll make this amazing whooshing noise and it'll just make a cloud of, of just steam. The whole thing just dissolves into a steam cloud. And I remember one night we did that probably five or six times. We would just run in and out of the building, filling up our coffee and throwing it up in the air, leaving clouds of coffee steam all over the place. And I think some of it made it to the ground, but not enough of it to really care about because all we really wanted to see was the cloud of steam because it was so cool. If you ever get a chance to go where it's that cold and bring a hot cup of coffee with you, do it by all means. It's fun. It's funny. It's also another sign of why um, people like me should not be allowed out around extreme temperatures like that. Because clearly, uh, I, even sober, I wasn't capable of making appropriate decisions on how to deal with that. And I knew what could happen to you. I knew you could die. I just, hmm, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I guess I was still young enough to think I was immortal. Who knows? Anyway, Jellid, Jellid, the cold that was in Alaska. 40 below, 50 below, my gosh, and a frozen beer. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this one now. I do wanna thank you again, and I think you're gonna hear me this time, for stopping by, for taking a few minutes of your day to, uh, to listen to me ramble on based on the word of the day. And that's what the improv monologue is about. It's about taking whatever the word of the day is and then telling you a story that is inspired by it. And, um, if you liked it, or if you're interested, go back and see some of the old ones, and then go ahead and click like, and then click subscribe, 
you can come back and see the next one that I do. I'll keep telling stories if you'll keep coming. Hell, I'll keep telling stories even if you don't, because I enjoy this. It's fun for me, and uh, I hope it's fun for you. So in the meantime, this has been the Improv Monologue of the Day. <laughs> you have a good one. Jellied. <laughs>